The bell rang, and the school corridor was crowded. Children ran out of the classrooms in anticipation of the long-awaited break and rushed to different places. Max came to pick up his daughter, a first grader. He squeezed through the crowd of shouting children to Tessa's classroom and cautiously peeked into the classroom. There was almost no one there already. His daughter was focused on putting her notebooks and pens in her backpack. She saw her daddy and wait. Hi, daddy. You are already here. Give me a minute. I'll be ready quickly. Do you know how smart I am? I got in it today. I told the poem we learned this weekend better than anyone else. The man smiled, stroked the girl, and praised her. My good girl, I didn't even doubt it would be like this. So, shall we go home now? I'll take you home, and then I'll go to work again, and you'll stay with the nanny. Do your homework with her. Tess immediately frowned. Come on, daddy. I don't want to stay with a nanny. I'm not a baby anymore. I'm seven years old. I can stay at home alone. Nanny Rachel is so boring. When will mommy get better and come home? I miss her so much. A painful lump immediately squeezed Max's throat. The man could barely contain his emotions, exhale, and force himself to smile weakly. Soon, mom will be back soon. But for now, you'll have to be patient. If you don't get cranky, we can go to the park for half an hour. The girl immediately brightened up again. Yay. All right, I'm ready. Shall we go? I have a scone in my backpack. I'll feed the pigeons there. Will you buy me cotton candy? I promise I'll eat my lunch at home later. His daughter was talking all the way, telling her father school news, and Max nodded, looking with love and unbearable pain at his snub-nosed little girl walking to the park. But in his mind, he was somewhere else. He was feverishly thinking. How can I tell my daughter that mom passed away, that she is no longer here and she will never come home? What words should I choose so as not to hurt the child too much? After all, she is only seven. Her mental health can be affected by the stress. Two months ago, irreparable grief happened in their family. Tessa's mom, Lisa, died. She was ill for a long time. She spent a couple of months in several hospitals, hoping for a miracle. But the disease slowly took away her last strength, and the woman died, even though she was so young. Max was heartbroken. He couldn't accept the death of his beloved wife, and he didn't dare to tell his daughter the terrible truth. The girl still believed that her mother was now sick and undergoing treatment in the hospital, far from home, and would be home soon. Max realized that it was not right and sooner or later, his daughter would find out the truth. And then it would be even worse, she would not forgive him for lying. But he didn't know how to tell Tessa the better truth. It was very quiet and sunny in the park. Passersby were leisurely strolling or chatting on benches. The girl swung a little on the swings on the playground, slid down the slide, and then just ran ahead of her father, throwing colorful, beautiful, falling leaves upwards. It was already time for Max to go back to work, but he looked at his daughter and thought, let her play a little more, have some fun she can do her homework later. It's not easy for her to be without her mom, but at least she'll be distracted a little. Suddenly, Tessa caught up with a woman walking ahead, who looked like a beggar. The girl pulled her by the sleeve. The woman turned around in surprise. Tessa suddenly widened her huge eyes and shouted joyfully, Mommy, Mommy, it's you. I immediately recognized you. Have you already recovered? You look so beautiful. I can see that you feel much better. I missed you so much, Mommy. I cried quietly at night so that Daddy wouldn't hear, and I hoped you'd come back soon. Do you want to see my report card from school? There's nothing but A's in it. I'm doing my best for you and Daddy. The girl rummaged in her backpack and handed her personal report card to the stranger. She took it, looked into it stroked Tessa's head, and then said gently, You're so smart, dear, you're studying so well. But I'm not your mom. You're wrong, it happens. My name is Sally. What's your mom's name? The girl suddenly took a closer look, realized that she was really wrong, and cried, wiping her tears on her cheeks, saying, Miss, I'm so sorry. I thought my mommy was back. I was wrong. I feel so bad without her. I keep waiting. 
but she doesn't come back from the hospital. Max hugged the girl tightly and began to comfort her. That's okay, kiddo. Don't cry. Mommy hasn't abandoned you and will be back soon. This woman really looks a lot like her. That's why you thought it was mom. And then he turned to the stranger. Hello. I'm sorry for this misunderstanding. But you really look a lot like my wife, Lisa. Do you know anyone named Lisa? Maybe you're related to her. You look a lot like my wife, same facial features and the same mole above your eyebrow. Only your hair and skin are darker. Suddenly the woman became nervous and began to say something incomprehensible in a frightened voice. I'm sorry, but I have to go. No, your wife and I don't know each other. I don't remember any Lisa. I don't know what you mean. Excuse me, I have to go. The man shrugged and handed her his business card. Here, take it. If you remember something or want to talk, call me. I can see you know something, but you don't want to say anything. Then Max took his daughter's hand. That's it, kiddo. We have to go, because daddy is late for the meeting, and you need to eat your lunch. Say goodbye and let's go. Tessa waved to the stranger and looked at her for a long time, but the woman quickly walked away without even looking back. The man took his daughter home and went to work again. He tried to focus on current problems and chores, but it was all in vain. His memories kept popping into his head, not allowing him to think about anything else. Max was born into a family of rich and successful entrepreneurs. His father owned a huge cleaning company, and things were going great. Since childhood, the boy had all the best, expensive clothes, and all sorts of gadgets. The whole family often vacationed at luxury resorts abroad. But at the same time, his father was a very strict but fair person. He loved comfort and a high standard of living. But he never wasted money for nothing because he remembered where he started. Peter was born into a simple middle-class family, and he built his entire business himself, step by step, starting from the bottom. He had to go through a lot of things on the way to success and wealth envy, enemies tricks, betrayal of his best friends. He taught his son from childhood not to boast of his position and never put himself above others to be friends with simple people, and to appreciate the way people treat them, not their money or position in society. And most importantly, to try to achieve everything on his own, and not to rely only on the wealth of his parents. Max adored his father and absorbed everything like a sponge, so he tried to be like his father in everything. But his mother was the opposite of his father, she was a very arrogant fashionista. She never worked anywhere and only enjoyed her life. Dad tolerated her female whims and weaknesses, as he loved his wife very much. Max studied diligently, graduated from one of the best universities, and decided to become an entrepreneur like his father. But he flatly refused to work at his father's company. It was important for the guy to achieve everything himself. So Max got a job in a small recruitment company. He worked very hard and invented non-standard and creative ways to attract clients, and soon the whole team began to appreciate and respect him for his skills and diligence. Besides, all the girls liked him, and they all tried to draw the rich boy's attention to themselves. He was handsome, generous, intelligent, and very which all women dream about such a husband. However, two pushy and frivolous ladies, who were ready to do anything to get a rich suitor, did not impress the guy, they seemed fake to him. And there was nothing to talk to them about. All they could talk about was expensive clothes and gossip. Therefore it so happened that Max chose the most shy and modest girl from the office, Lisa, her desk was next to his workplace. At first, the young people communicated only on work-related topics, but soon they felt something between them, and then a spark of love was ignited. Lisa was raised by foster parents. They loved her, were not poor people, and left her a good apartment and a car. Unfortunately, they died early. But for some reason, his fiancé didn't like to talk about her childhood or about her parents, and when Max was too persistent, she even got angry and tried to change the subject. You know, honey, I had a complicated relationship with my parents, but I don't know how to explain it. 
I'm very grateful to them. They did a lot for me. They gave me a great education, and I never lacked anything. And I loved them. But everything is not as simple and cloudless as it seems. I'll tell you everything someday, okay? But not now. Eventually, Max decided not to talk about it again. He had no idea what childhood Lisa really had. At the same time, he always loved to talk about his childhood. Often entertaining the girl with different stories of his adventures, there was a lot to tell about. Lisa was a pretty girl with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a pleasant smile. But Max loved her not only for her beauty, it was not important for him at all. She tried to see the soul in people, not money. Soon the couple got married. They had a very modest wedding and invited only relatives and close friends. They had their own small world, which only they understood, and they were happy in that world. But there was one upsetting thing Lisa had heart problems since childhood due to a genetic disease, and doctors didn't allow her to get pregnant. It was dangerous for her life. Of course, the couple wanted to have children because the family cannot be absolutely happy without children. But Max did not insist. He understood that her health is more important. But still, Lisa decided to take a risk. When she got pregnant, she didn't tell anyone and didn't go to the doctor. Even Max found out about it only when felt unwell and an ambulance took her to the hospital. He was shocked that Lisa decided to risk her life and keep the baby. But it was impossible to talk her out of it. She repeated many times that life without a baby was meaningless and empty for her. The pregnancy was difficult, but she gave birth to a healthy baby girl, Tessa. The young parents loved their daughter. Now they were over the moon, but the childbirth caused the development of other diseases, and the old problems became more acute. Lisa was sick very often. She slowly faded away. It was as if her strength was leaving her. When Tessa turned five, her health finally failed. Lisa was in the hospital almost all the time. Max was exhausted, trying to cope with raising his daughter, working, and worrying about Lisa's health. The little girl would sit by her mother's bedside in the hospital room, holding her hand and whispering, Mommy, my dear, please get well soon. Daddy and I love you and miss you so much. When will you be discharged? Tears were streaming down Lisa's cheeks. She smiled, reassuring her girl. Soon, sweetie, I'm already better. I will stay here a little longer and then come back home. We will read bedtime stories together as before. Make your favorite scrambled eggs and sing songs. I miss you too, my dear, and I love you very much. Max's heart was breaking to pieces at such moments. He prayed and hoped that a miracle would happen and his wife would recover, that everything would be the same as before. He bought the most expensive medicines, went to many different doctors, and could not believe that there was no salvation from this disease. He even went to witch doctors. But a miracle didn't happen, and two months ago, his beloved died in the hospital. The doctors couldn't save her. Since that day, his life turned into hell. He desperately missed Lisa, and saw her in his dreams almost every night she gently stroked his head and looked at him so tenderly. It was unbearable. The man would wake up in a cold sweat, looking around, hoping to see his beloved next to him. But there was no one there, only a cold silk sheet. Besides, his daughter kept asking him when her mother would come back. He didn't know what to say. And today, when Max saw his wife's copy and Tessa called her mom, he suddenly realized that he couldn't lie anymore. This way the child is suffering even more, waiting and hoping for mom to come back. He should tell Tessa everything, no matter how hard it would be. In the evening, Max quietly opened the door to the nursery. His daughter was sitting on the window sill in her pajamas, wrapped in a blanket, holding the teddy bear her mother had given her for her birthday, and looking sadly out the window. Though she should have been asleep long ago, the man sat down next to her on the bed, put his daughter in his arms, hugged his little girl, and quietly said, Can't fall asleep, kitten. It's already late. You have to get up early for school tomorrow. Do you miss mommy? The girl sighed heavily and nodded. Yes, Daddy. I keep waiting for her to come back. But they don't discharge her. Mommy is very sick. Will she recover? 
I feel so bad without her. When will mommy be at home with us like before? Max's heart clenched so hard again that he couldn't breathe for a moment. He clenched his fists, trying not to cry, exhale, and carefully began. Daughter, sweetheart, I have to tell you something, something very important. I don't want to lie to you anymore. It's not fair. Mommy is not sick anymore. She doesn't have any pain, because now she lives on a soft cloud in the sky and looks at you and me all the time. But she can't come back to us. But she still loves us very much, and we love her. I feel bad without her too, honey. So bad that I want to cry. But you and I are strong. We have to be strong, and always remember her. Do you understand me, sweetheart? Tessa looked at her father in silence for a long time. And then she nodded, hugged him, and cried quietly. Max also didn't hold his emotions anymore. They were sitting like that for a long time. Embraced. Max stroked his little girl, and finally, he felt a little better. At least now, he doesn't have to lie every day. But that stranger from the park didn't go out of his head. Who was she and why did she look so much like his late wife? And what secret was she hiding? She was dressed poorly, almost like a beggar, but neatly. Probably her life was very difficult. And her eyes, the same blue eyes, just like Lisa's. A few days passed. Max was about to go home when his phone rang unexpectedly. The number was unfamiliar. He answered, and a soft female voice sounded in the receiver. Good afternoon, this is Sally. Do you remember me? We met in the park the other day, and your daughter thought I was her mom. You left me your business card then. I lied to you that day, and now I regret it. If you wish, we can meet somewhere and talk about everything. Max got excited and immediately answered. Hello, Sally. Glad you changed your mind. How about we go to the cafe in about an hour? It's always not too crowded there and we can chat in a cozy atmosphere. The entrepreneur was very nervous. He hurriedly finished his work, called the nanny to babysit Tessa, and headed to the meeting place. All these days, he could not stop thinking about this mysterious stranger. Max arrived first, sat down at the table ordered two cups of coffee, and waited. Finally, Sally entered the cafe. The man looked closely. She was poorly dressed again, old out-of-date coat, shabby boots, and a slightly oversized dress. Obviously it was someone else's dress, but everything was clean and neat. The girl was young, obviously younger than his late wife, and her face was pretty. Sally was obviously very excited and a little nervous. She said hello took a sip of coffee, and began to tell her story. You know, Max, I was very confused in the park when your daughter called me mom, and for some reason, I lied to you. But I thought it over at home, talked to my mom, and decided that you have the right to know everything. Actually, I don't just know Lisa. I'm her biological sister. May I ask what's wrong with her? Why her daughter doesn't see her? We've been separated for so many years, and I'd really like to meet her. Is that possible? Max sighed heavily, swallowed the lump that came up to his throat, and said quietly, My wife died a couple of months ago. I just couldn't tell my daughter the truth. I thought it would be better this way. But yesterday I told her everything. Tessa cried for a long time, but she stopped asking questions about her mom. So, unfortunately, you can't see her. I only can show you Lee's is great. Tell me everything. Why didn't I know my wife had a sister? Why didn't you two communicate? How could that happen? Usually, sisters are very close. Sally cried quietly and covered her face with her hands. I can't believe it. Why am I being punished like this? I thought I could see Lisa, hug her, tell her everything. I've been trying to find her for so many years but I only found grief again. To help you understand everything, I'll start from our birth. The story is long and complicated, like a thriller. My sister and I were born into a dysfunctional family. Our parents were extremely irresponsible. My father didn't have a job. He rarely worked at construction sites, and my mother had been on maternity leave for as long as I can remember. Lisa was born first, and I was born three years later so she didn't have time to work anywhere. 
Both mom and dad loved noisy parties with friends. They didn't want to think about the future, didn't know how to save money, and didn't want to. It often happened that when my father managed to earn some money, he would immediately buy us a lot of sweets, a lot of snacks, and alcohol, and they invited a lot of friends. But a week later there was nothing to eat at home, and our parents were fighting from dusk to dawn. But despite all of this, we loved Daddy very much. He was very kind. He adored us, played with us. Mom was more strict, but she also loved us in her own way. Lisa was always like a second mother to me, though she was not much older than me, but she tried to take care of me. She and I were very friendly. We shared all our childhood joys and sorrows. When my sister was eight and I was five, our parents died. They were driving home after a party. My father was drunk, but still decided to drive a car. They crashed into another car. Death was instantaneous. No one survived. My sister and I cried for a long time. We missed our parents, and we couldn't recover, especially when they took us to the orphanage. It was so hard to find yourself in a cold, gloomy building where everyone was a stranger. We couldn't believe we were going to stay there forever. I followed Lee's everywhere, even to the bathroom. I was afraid of everything. Freddie, the orphanage director, was a very kind old man. All the kids loved him. He promised Lisa that he would do everything possible to get us both into the same family because sisters are not supposed to be separated. In six months some rich family came to the orphanage, but they had special criteria they needed a blonde girl without bad heredity, smart and clever so that she would look like her foster mom. Lisa was a perfect match for these requirements, but I wasn't. I'm dark-haired, besides, they didn't plan to raise two children. The director tried to persuade them for a long time, but still, they decided to adopt only Lisa. My sister was screaming, crying, holding my hands, and not wanting to let go. I was also very frightened. I couldn't imagine surviving in the orphanage alone. Without my beloved sister, she was everything to me, the closest and dearest person. As a sign of protest, Lisa and I locked ourselves in the storage room and spent 24 hours there naively believing that then the adults would hear us and would not separate us. And then Freddy lied to us. He said that he had persuaded the foster family to adopt us both. That at first, they would adopt Lisa, and after a couple of months they would adopt me too because they had to get used to us gradually. My sister and I were just kids, we trusted him. What else could we do? When Lisa was taken away by her foster parents, I ran after them all the way to the gate and begged them to take me too, and then I cried for a long time, screaming loudly. I remember that when Lisa turned around, she was crying too and shouted, Don't cry, my dear. I'll find you and take you away from this place. Trust me. Then I withdrew in myself. I hardly spoke to anyone. A month passed, another month, another month, but no one came for me. I could not believe that I was betrayed and abandoned forever. I kept sitting at the window every day waiting for my sister. Soon I got sick. So sick that I couldn't get up at all. Probably it was because of constant stress because I was desperately longing for my sister. I couldn't believe that I had been betrayed and abandoned. I couldn't even eat anything. I vomited immediately. They took me to the hospital for treatment and examined me, but they didn't find any serious illnesses. I was just lying there turning my face to the wall, and I didn't even cry anymore. I whimpered like an abandoned and unneeded puppy. There was a boy in the same ward, Danny, who was five years older than me. He tried to cheer me up, to talk to me, told me a lot about himself, about his family, that he lived with his mother and loved her very much, that she makes delicious cakes. But I couldn't hear it. Someone loved every child. Someone needed every child but nobody in the whole world needed me. It was so frustrating. Was I worse than all the other kids? One day his mother, Amy, came to Danny's room. She was an ordinary, middle-aged, overweight woman with chubby, rough hands and such tender and kind eyes. She was the one who gradually brought me back to life. At first, she was silently sitting on the edge of my bed and stroking my shoulders, but I didn't react. 
I just didn't trust people anymore. The next time she was no longer silent. At first she stroked my head and then she started talking. Poor baby, you have to go through such an ordeal. Not every adult can withstand such a misfortune. Darling, turn to me and look what I've brought you. Do you like this hedgehog? It's so funny, and the apple on its thorns looks just like a real one. Take it. I bought it for you. I turned around because it had been so long since anyone had spoken to me so gently. It was so nice. I took the hedgehog, and since then, I haven't parted with it. I still have it in my room. Gradually, I came to my senses. I started communicating with her and Danny, and we became very good friends. And I started to recover, to eat, to gain weight, and to be interested in everything again. When Danny was discharged, Amy put me on her lap. I felt so cozy, just like in my mother's lap, and I was not scared at all. Amy put her arms around me and quietly asked, Sally, I'd like to adopt you, to take you home to me and Danny, so you can be my dear little daughter. What do you think about that? Would you like to live with us? I don't want you to cry ever again, and I don't want you to be alone again. I hugged her tightly instead of answering and didn't let her go for a long time. And then I told her, I'll be waiting for you, Mom. Please take me away from this place. That's how I ended up in their family. And I never regretted it, even though we lived very poorly. Danny always treated me warmly, as if I were his real sister. He never hurt me and protected me from the boys in the neighborhood. My mother denied herself everything. She wore the same coat for years, but she always bought me and Danny new clothes for school so that we would not be worse than others. She gave us everything. When I was sick, my mom always sat by my bedside all night long, worried and couldn't sleep. Only when I grew up, did I fully realize what a heroic deed my foster mother had done by adopting me, knowing that now she would have to deny herself literally everything. Danny grew up, moved to another city for work, and stayed there, got married, and has a family there. We call each other often and talk to each other. My mom got sick two years ago. She was losing weight, eating badly, sleeping a lot, and complaining of stomach pains. I begged her to go to the doctor she worked in the hospital as a nurse. I blamed myself so much for not insisting that she go to the doctor sooner. She was diagnosed with a serious disease at a late stage when treatment was no longer effective. But we don't give up. We fight. We undergo chemotherapy. I save every dollar I want to save up for her surgery in time. The doctor believes it would prolong her life for years. I am so worried about my mom. I'm immensely grateful to this saint woman, who gave me her love and affection and gave me a helping hand in such a difficult moment. The girl sipped more coffee and fell silent. Max didn't interrupt, waiting for the continuation. Then he couldn't stand it and asked himself, Yeah, not fun. What about your personal life? Do you have a family? Where do you work? Sally became even more sad and sighed. I finished medical courses after school, and now I work as a nurse in a hospital, like my mother, and my family. I had a fiancé, Matt. He said that he loved me and that he would marry me. But as soon as he found out I was pregnant, he immediately left me. He pretended he didn't know me and found a rich girlfriend. That's it. I was too naive, too stupid. It's my own fault. Now I will be a single mother, but I can do nothing about it although I have no idea what to do. My miserable paycheck is barely enough to survive. I thought my mother would criticize me, but no, she loves me and dreams of surviving till she has grandchildren. I never saw Lizzie again. I didn't know anything about her, although all these years I really wanted to find her. I even went to the orphanage when I grew up. But there was a new director, and of course, no one told me anything about her or her foster family. So, your daughter Tess is my niece. She's such a wonderful girl. I'd really like to communicate with her, to be friends with her, if you don't mind. You know, Max, come to visit me and my mother. I'll introduce you to her. She's wonderful, hospitable. I'm sure you'll become friends. The man smiled, 
he was glad that now he had a nice new relative, and said, We will not only come to visit. I will take care of you and help you. After all, we are family. Lisa's sister is not a stranger to me. So give me your address and wait for me and Tessa this weekend. From that day Max and Sally became friends. They talked a lot. And Sally quickly found a common language with the little girl. Tessa was very attracted to her because the girl lacked mother's warmth and affection. On weekends Sally stayed with her niece instead of a nanny. They drew and played together. The little girl began to recover from the shock after the news of her mother's death. Sally got used to Tessa, loved her very much and felt sorry for her. One day Sally asked Max, Show me pictures of my sister please. I remember her as a child, but I would like to know more about her life. The man sighed heavily and pointed to the room. Here is Lisa's room, there is our family album, all her personal belongings, her closet after her death. I still can't bring myself to sort it all out. I just enter the room and immediately want to howl with longing. I sob and can't help myself. My daughter, on the contrary, spends a lot of time there, sitting in her mother's favorite chair. It makes her feel better. And you, if you want, you can take anything you like or need. I don't mind. Sally carefully opened the door and stepped in. She looked around, sat down at the table where the album was, and began to flip the pages one by one admiring her sister. She grew up and became a beauty. Indeed, as the sisters got older, they looked even more like each other. Lisa was so happy and cheerful on all the photos. Sally stroked the photos and quietly cried. And then she saw another album on the shelf. She thought there were photos there too. But no, it turned out to be Lisa's diary. It was old and tattered. Sally couldn't resist and began to read every line because it was very important for her to know how her sister lived and what she was thinking about. It's my birthday today. I'm turning 15. Everyone congratulated me. My parents invited a lot of guests. We will celebrate. Dad gave me a new expensive phone, I'm glad, but this is not the kind of gift I was expecting. I have only one wish to find my sister Sally. I begged my parents to let me visit her at the orphanage. Maybe she was adopted too. I feel so bad for her. I'm older than my sister, so I'm responsible for everything. Five years ago, the director lied to us so brazenly and shamelessly, promising that they would adopt me first and then they would adopt Sally. Even though he knew from the beginning that this would never happen, I was so stupid. I believed it. I just left my little sister alone at the orphanage, and I promised her I'd take her away from that hell. I can't even imagine how she's suffering. I guess she hates me. I live in a rich family. I have everything I want, but she stayed there, in a place full of strangers. I don't understand my parents. Why didn't they want to adopt my little sister? They won't let me see her, and I don't know why. I don't know how to talk to them. Sally, honey, I miss you so much. I would easily give away all my presents right now if they told me we could meet. Sally sobbed as she read these lines. So, Lisa always remembered her too, worried about her, missed her. Lisa didn't write something in her diary every day, but wrote down only the most important events probably when she wanted to talk about it. A couple of pages later, another interesting thing caught her eye. I'm marrying Max today. I'm so happy. We love each other. I believe we will live a long and happy life. And my most cherished wish will come true. I'm afraid to tell my beloved about my little sister. I'm afraid that he will not understand me, or he will judge me for leaving her in the orphanage. But it's not my fault. Max doesn't know anything yet, but after the wedding, I'll go to the orphanage myself and try to find out something about Sally. I'm so worried. What if I will find her? It would be such a blessing. After a few more pages, Sally found another note. The handwriting was uneven, some of the letters blurred, and it was obvious that Lisa had been crying when she wrote these lines. All in vain. The orphanage director died a long time ago and another person replaced him. I never managed to find out anything about Sally. Why? Why did fate separate us for the rest of our lives? My parents are dead. 
and I have no one left except Max and my daughter. But I don't want to hurt my family, so I can't tell them everything. But I want to talk to my sister so much. If you only knew how much I suffer without you, my dear. My disease has now worsened. After childbirth it is getting worse. I suffer from shortness of breath. My lips turn blue, and my heart seems to stop. But I don't tell anyone about it. I know Max will panic. He's very worried about me. He tries to persuade me to go to the hospital again. But I hate hospitals so much. And I'm worried about my daughter. If something happens to me, how will my poor little girl live without her mom? Sally, sister, I miss you so much. If I only knew where you were, I would fly on wings and hug you so tight. And the last message was a month before she died. This is probably the last time I'm writing. I feel very bad. I can barely hold a pen in my hands. Tomorrow I will go to the hospital again. My husband believes in miracles and in the great professors, but I don't. I feel I don't have long to live. I dedicate this letter to my most beloved people. Max, my love, you will always remain my only love. Remember that you are the best husband and daddy. When you read these lines, I will be gone, but I want to tell you a lot of things. Don't give up. Take care of our daughter, Tessa, protect her, and always be there for her. She is our most precious treasure. If someday you will meet and love another woman, I will not mind, though it is not easy for me to write these lines. The main thing is that she should love Tessa sincerely. And most importantly, I inherited very expensive jewelry, coins, and a lot of money from my parents. Here's the code to the safe deposit box where you can get it all after I die. I never touched this inheritance and did not tell anyone about it, because I was always a little offended. Why would I need all this money if they separated me from my sister? I dreamed of finding my sister and giving it all to her, every last dime of it, and that's the least I could do for her. But I guess I won't be able to do that. I won't have time. It's so scary to realize that I'm going to die. I want to live, raise and love my daughter, my husband, my dear, my family. I love all of you so much, and I don't want to part with you. I can't write any more. The tears don't let me. They drip right on my diary. Sally didn't even notice that she was sobbing. It was as if she was experiencing all of Lisa's suffering. Max was standing behind her and he was reading everything over her shoulder too. A tear rolled down his cheek. He said quietly, I knew that Lisa had a diary. Sometimes I saw her writing something there, but it was not accepted in our family to rummage through of personal belongings. And then, I thought it was just a female thing. I thought there was nothing special, so I didn't pay much attention to it. But it turns out that there was so much going on in Lisa's soul, and I didn't even realize it. She didn't want to hurt me, silly girl. She kept silent about her disease for so long. And then he suddenly looked at Sally so strangely and intently and said, Listen, do you believe in fate? Maybe it was Lisa who arranged this unexpected meeting in the park. You could have just passed by, and Tessa could have never even looked at you. You know. But we met. That eyes. Lisa's dream came true. Tomorrow we'll go to the bank. I'll withdraw the money, take all the jewelry, and give it all to you. That's what my wife wanted. You'll need it for childbirth, for the baby. Sally cried and whispered, folding her hands in the form of a prayer. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sweetheart. I love you so much, too. Thank you, Max. And thank you, Tessa. She was the one who noticed me first. I was on the verge of despair. I was so overwhelmed. My fiancé left me. My mom has cancer. I'm pregnant. I was about to kill myself. To be honest, sometimes I didn't even have money to buy some bread. I had to pay for medicine. And now I can help my mom. I can finally pay for her surgery. The man took her hand. No, I'll take care of the surgery, as I promised. And you should think about the baby now. You'll have to buy so much stuff. And anyway, we're family, so we'll handle everything. But I really respect Lisa's noble deed. She saved it all for you, Sally. She loved you very much. 
and she believed that we would find you. That's worth a lot. You know what? Let's go to her grave tomorrow. Check on my beloved and thank her for everything. I think it will be pleasant for her there, in heaven. So they did. Sally cried for a long time, telling her sister everything, whispering how much she loved her, how grateful she was for everything. Max's soul was torn to shreds again. He was so sad and felt so bad without Lisa. It seemed that no one could replace her. Max paid for Sally's foster mom's surgery, as promised, and after a long treatment, the woman started recovering. The doctors gave encouraging prognoses. She was very grateful to Max and her daughter for saving her. Her son Danny also helped financially. The whole family united and won the battle with death. The woman never once regretted that she had adopted Sally. There was always a close mental bond between them, the kind only found between relatives. Sally's belly was huge. It was getting more and more difficult for her to walk, and it was not comfortable to sleep. Max was always by her side, supporting and helping her. During this time, they became so close that they could not imagine how they lived without each other. Sally gave birth to a beautiful boy on time. She named him Alex, in honor of her late father. After all, she had loved him so much when she was a child. Tessa was also happy. Now she proudly rolled the stroller, and when the baby cried, she put a pacifier in his mouth. And she really loved this cute little baby. Sally spent more and more time at Max's house together with Alex. Sometimes she stayed overnight on weekends. She felt so good in their family. It seemed as if they had always lived together. She also realized that she really liked Max. She mentally compared him to the stupid and irresponsible Matt and realized how lucky her sister was to have such a wonderful and reliable husband. But she didn't dare to think about something more. She didn't want to betray her late sister. But Max didn't see Sally as an attractive woman for a long time. His heart belonged only to his beloved Lisa. But time passed. The baby grew up, Tessa went to the third grade, and Sally and Max were still close friends. They had no secrets from each other. But the fear of betraying Lisa was firmly embedded in Max's and Sally's heads, so they never crossed the invisible line. But one day, everything changed. When Alex started kindergarten, Max hired Sally to his company as a trainee, and he was teaching her everything. He couldn't accept the fact that his wife's sister was working as a hospital nurse for a miserable salary. Now they traveled to work and back home together, and looked more and more like a real family. One day, Sally and Max were walking to the car after picking up Alex from daycare when a young man got out of his car in the parking lot nearby. At first, he just passed by, but then he turned around, looked at Sally, and ran up to the couple. He looked intently at Sally and exclaimed, Sally, is that you? I can't believe my eyes. What are you doing here? You look so beautiful now. I'm impressed. And your car is so cool. The girl trembled. Her ex-fiancé Matt was standing in front of her. She replied irritably, What do you want? And why do you care who I'm with and where? You removed me from your life three years ago. Leave me alone. We have nothing to talk about. But the guy wouldn't stop. Is that your son? Right. Or rather, our son. I'm not stupid. I can count. What's his name? Why don't we talk over a cup of coffee? I'd like that very much. Nina left me a long time ago. She turned out to be such a fool. I've often thought of you, you know. Sally flared up like a match at such impudence. It's not your son, okay? Goodbye. I hope we won't meet again. Matt squinted his eyes. No, Sally, I'm not going to let you go. I have a right to communicate with my son. And I'll definitely win you back. So I'm not saying goodbye. Max couldn't take it anymore. Listen, are you deaf? This is my wife and my son. Leave my family alone. Matt walked away but decided to find out everything about Sally. It was amazing how different she was. The modest shiners had suddenly turned into a businesswoman, and she was wearing expensive and stylish clothes. Rumors were spreading quickly in the city, and soon Matt found out everything. 
Sally got an inheritance from her late sister, and now she was rich, and that impudent guy was not even her husband. The guy rubbed his hands together. Now he wanted to make up with Sally. Why not? She is rich and attractive now, and her son was already grown up. No need to deal with diapers. Everything was just perfect. Now he picked her up from work every day, gave beautiful flowers, and was modestly silent. And when she frowned, he answered quietly, Sally, I'm so sorry. Only now did I realize how much I love you. I'm ready to wait forever for your forgiveness. I was an idiot when I left you for that silly girl. But now I've realized everything. You and I loved each other. And we have a son. Maybe we should start all over again. At first, Sally avoided Matt like he was an annoying fly. She thought it was all in the past for her. But the guy was surprisingly persistent. He gave her such beautiful violets and roses, kept talking about love, insisted on a date. Finally, her heart trembled. But she decided to give him a chance and agreed to go on a date, just because she didn't understand whether she still loved him or not. Everything was so tangled up in her soul anger, resentment. But her feelings flared up again. She still liked Max. But he would never offer her anything but friendship. But she wanted tenderness, love, normal family. And her son needed a father, no matter what. But Max seemed to be going crazy. He couldn't bear to watch Matt woo Sally. He wanted to kill them both. But why? He tried to understand himself. He thought a lot about it. And finally realized that he was jealous. That he couldn't accept it if she agreed to date Matt. Max, he needed her like hair. Why hadn't he noticed that before? Sally was getting ready for a date. She put on a beautiful dress with a deep cut on the back, heel shoes, styled her hair, and applied light makeup. It had been so long since anyone had asked her out on a date. She had even forgotten what it was like. But she was still worried. How would their date go? Had Matt really changed and understood everything? Could she trust him? After all, he had already betrayed her once. But she calmed herself down. We're going to a restaurant, just to have dinner, talk, and then we'll see. Matt was waiting for her at the entrance wearing a beautiful suit and holding a gorgeous bouquet of scarlet roses. He saw Sally and exclaimed, You're a goddess, a beauty queen. Shall we go to the ball? All the men will envy me tonight. Sally was embarrassed by such compliments. It had been so long since she heard any compliments at all. Max found out that Sally went on a date with Matt and was furious. He paced around the apartment like a caged tiger and couldn't calm down. He was angry. Why? I did everything for her. Why is she doing this to me? Tessa was doing her homework and watched her father suffering. Then she couldn't stand it anymore. Walked up to her father and said, Daddy, can I give you some advice? If you don't do something, we will lose Sally. Is that what you want? I love her, you love her too, so why are you letting her go? Max looked at his daughter in surprise. But what can I do? Should I tie her up with ropes? I guess she simply doesn't need us since she chose that guy. Tessa said indignantly. Did you propose to her? Did you even give her flowers once? I'm not a little girl anymore, daddy, and I'll tell you something. Women need to feel that men like them. But what are you doing? You didn't say a word, or do you think Sally's a mind reader? She loves you, Daddy. I can see it in her eyes. Max realized that his daughter was right. He had never let her know that he loved her, that she was important to him, but he probably didn't realize it himself until now. He was just used to her always being there for him, and he thought it would always be like that. No way. I'm not going to lose her. I'm going to go and tell her everything right now and I'll make sure that Matt never appears in our life again. Max thought and got ready to go. At first, the evening was going brilliantly. An expensive restaurant, nice music, champagne, and delicious meals. But the more Sally talked to Matt, the more disappointed she became in her suitor. He never once asked about her son, and when she deliberately started talking about him, he immediately made a bored face and gently changed the subject to a more intimate one. He kept hinting at intimacy, and the drunker he got, the more wild he behaved. 
When he invited her to dance, he started touching the curves of her body and tried to kiss her. Sally felt so uncomfortable and disgusted. She realized that her ex had not changed at all. He was just playing the right role, and he only wanted to possess her, nothing more. Sally looked at him and Miss Max more and more. She thought about his deep, tender gaze. All that she wanted to do right now was to immediately leave. Finally, she stood up and said firmly, I'm sorry, Matt, but I realized that our meeting was a mistake. I don't love you anymore. I'm sorry. And then the man showed his true face. He smiled tensely and replied in a cold voice, No, Sally, that's not what I expected. I spent the whole month wooing you. I almost bankrupted myself buying you those stupid flowers. Who's gonna pay for it? I didn't spend money on you all this time so that you just walk away now. Don't be stubborn. You were more nice before. You jumped into my arms yourself. Come on, sweetheart. Sally walked out of the restaurant, saying, I was so stupid, how could I believe that you changed? Matt was furious because he had expected a pleasant continuation. He didn't expect all his efforts to be in vain. He followed Sally, caught up with her, and grabbed her arms, hugging and pulling her closer to him. Oh, you smell so good. What's that perfume? Come on, don't resist. You can't escape anyway. Let's go to the hotel. Sally was very frightened. It was already dark, and there were no people around. She tried to break free and shouted, Get away from me. Leave me alone. Somebody help me. And then Max appeared as if out of nowhere. He saved Sally and hit her offender, saying, I guess you didn't get it right last time. She's my wife. Never bother her again. If I ever see you near her again, you'll end up in a wheelchair. He hugged Sally and took her to the car. The girl was crying, clinging to Max. She felt so good and comfortable with him. She finally realized that he was the dearest man in her life. In the car, Max put his hands on her face and said, looking into her eyes, I was so jealous. I almost went crazy. I didn't even think I was capable of doing such a thing. Sally, I suddenly realized that I love you deeply, truly, like I loved Lisa. I want you to be my wife. I want us to be together until our last breath. I will never let you down again, my love. Finally, Sally heard the special words she had been dreaming of for three years. She couldn't even believe it, but she asked anyway. I've loved you for a long time too, Max, except. What about my sister? Aren't we betraying her now? Max replied quietly. You know, I think she'll be happy for us. You love Tessa, and she loves you and I love Alex. We are real family. That's what Lisa asked for in her diary. Remember, we need to let go of this false sense of guilt that torments us and just move on. We need to enjoy our lives, cherish every minute we spend together. You know, Sally nodded. You're right about everything. Thank you for coming into my life and for bringing happiness and love into it. I never dreamed of such a life. And Lisa, she will remain my dear little sister in my memory forever. Max and Sally began to kiss passionately. Their hungry bodies and souls literally burst into flames of love. Surprisingly, on that special night, when they slept in each other's arms, they had the same dream. Lisa looked at them, smiled, and sent them an air kiss. She whispered, be happy. And then she sailed off into the sky again. Max and Sally were surprised in the morning when they told each other the same dream. It was hard to believe it. Max philosophically remarked, I think Lisa has blessed us, so she's not angry. Now everything will be fine for sure. Suddenly Tessa's voice came from the kitchen. Daddy, Sally, where are you? Isn't breakfast ready yet? I'm actually late for school. And Alex is late for daycare. Or is it okay not to go anywhere today? Since that day, it seemed like Max revived. He felt like a real man again, strong, brave, standing at the helm and steering the family ship. But he always remembered Lise and kept the bright memories of her deep in his heart.